Hey everyone, my name is Christy. Welcome to my corner. Today we're in my baking corner because we're going to do another recipe out of the National Cookbook by Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson. And I had said last week when I made those German cakes that I wanted to bake something different than I had been because in reality the jumbles and the German cakes were pretty similar things. So I was looking through the, the recipes on offer and I happened upon French bread pudding and I've been wanting to make bread pudding for a while because I bake bread. I bake basically all our loaf bread. Um, any specialty bread I usually buy, but loaf bread like toasts and sandwiches I make. And I make about two loaves every week and a half or so. And because it's fresh bread and there's no preservatives in it, by the time you get to the peel of the bread, it's not as like soft and delicious, right? It's, it's kind of dried out and you don't really want to eat it. So what I've started doing was taking those ends, putting them in a bag, and putting them in the freezer in order to make bread pudding. Um, my fiance really likes bread pudding, and so I thought that that would be a good way to not waste that bread, because it is actually quite a lot of work to bake two loaves of bread every other week. So I found this French bread pudding, and I thought this would be a nice, easy recipe, quick video, quick bake. So the recipe has five ingredients, um, bread, obviously, milk, eggs, dried currants, and I'm going to use a mixture of cranberries and dried cherries because I just don't have currants, um, and then sugar to the taste. And I don't know how much that is, so I have a quarter cup of sugar. It may be way too much sugar. We'll find out. So I thought that this would be very easy until I realized that the bread recipe is one half of a four cent baker's loaf is the quantity of bread. The problem, of course, is that I don't know how much bread is one half of a four cent baker's loaf because there is currently no such thing as a four cent baker's loaf of bread. And I love the history of bread. In fact, I have a whole lecture on the history of bread from ancient Mesopotamia and the Epic of Gilgamesh through the French Revolution, um, through the you know, medieval period. I think that the history of bread is fascinating. And if you watched my history of tea, one of the things that I said was that um, the history of mundane things to me is the most interesting because it passes through so many hands and it gains so much meaning and bread has so much meaning throughout um, you know, society. Uh, the societies that eat bread give it a lot of meaning is what I'm trying to say. So I decided to kind of dig into the history of bread in the 19th century. I don't actually know much about 19th century food culture. It's way past my time, uh, my time period that I study. Uh, and, and what I discovered is that the 19th century was actually a very exciting time for bread. Who knew? Um, so she's publishing this book in 1856, and not too long after, um, Fleischmann started selling their dried yeast to a mass market. And dried yeast really revolutionizes uh, how people bake bread, right? Before that, you know, in this case, she's putting a half a cup of yeast or a cup of yeast into her recipes but with um, dried yeast, you don't have to like keep yeast going, right? You can, I mean, that's what most people use today is dried yeast. So that was a really exciting kind of moment in bread history in the 19th century. Uh, Hannah dies in 1870. And by 1870, we have dried yeast and we also have baking soda. And baking soda makes quick breads, like Irish soda breads. And that again, revolutionizes cooking, um, not just breads also, but also cakes all the cakes that we eat these days, almost all the cakes we eat these days, the rising agent is baking soda or baking powder. So this is a really exciting time for bread making. And the question then is, what does it mean? The thing that I kind of want to dig into is why it's called French bread pudding. When the bread is a four cent baker's loaf, which doesn't sound fancy or French to me, so what does French bread mean in the 19th century? And as I was looking up um, the information on Fleischmann's yeast and on baking soda, um, I came across foodtimeline.org and what this tells me, according to English Bread and Yeast Cookery by Elizabeth David in 1979, is that in England and the US in the early 19th century, bakers, especially home bakers, started using tins to bake their bread instead of doing a boule or like what we would call an artisan loaf now. 
but this was not adopted in the rest of Europe. And so my guess is that a French bread loaf in 1856 Philadelphia was an untinned loaf, what we would call an artisan loaf or like a boule. The rest of this now is, of course, trying to figure out how much bread one half of a four cent baker's loaf is. And I'm going to be honest, I don't remember the exact path I took. When I tried to kind of recreate that idea for this part of the video, I came up with different numbers. So I'm going to show you where I went to get this information, who I got the information from, um, so you can at least see my thought process. I spent several hours looking into this, so I did try to be as accurate as possible. In the end, I kind of went with what felt right to me, which is a lot of what I do when I'm baking. Um, I'm not very good at precision, which means that my baking sometimes doesn't turn out so great because I am not that great at precision. But in this case, it worked well. So I'm going to take you through this research process and um, show you some resources where you can find information if you want to research these old recipes uh, with very strange measurements. So the first thing I did, as I think we all do, is I googled 4 cent baker's loaf bread 1850. I thought, man, wouldn't that be great if someone had already done this work for me and I didn't have to do it and, you know, I could, they could give me the answer. Um, that was not the case. I, I did get the foodtimeline.org came up first. And as I scrolled down, I found the price of a loaf of bread in the 18th and 19th centuries at johnharefield.com. So I went to that site just to see what information he had. And he had a lot of information for the 18th century and the early 19th century. But if you scroll down, I thought this aside from the London Evening Post is very interesting, but it's from 1758, which is really, really early. But it gives me an idea that in, in 1758 in London, that a two penny loaf of sort of normal household bread was one pound eight ounces, so a pound and a half, which means that a hundred years later there would be some inflation and a one pound eight ounce loaf of bread would cost more than two pennies. So that's kind of where I was. So I just kept scrolling down um, and then I came down to this part here, the price of bread, this information about how much wheat cost in 1821. And then I read this part here that I highlighted. I'm going to assume that the mechanic would have bought his bread in two pound loaves. So the next question is how much of that two pounds was wheat? So I'm less worried about his question. But my question is where did you get this idea that mechanics, that people bought their bread in two pound loaves? Right, because um, to me two pounds is a lot of bread, but it turns out it actually isn't very much bread. But that's essentially where I got my initial idea that uh, that bread comes in two pound loaves in the 19th century. But I needed to verify this. I had to double check that this is part of my job is double checking stuff. So let's double check this. I decided to Google the price of bread 1850 in the U.S. And what I found was this library guide at the University of Missouri. And this was a gold mine. So what this tells us is on the right here, we have prices in the United States from 1850 to 1859. And we have food prices by 15 states. We have Ohio cities, prices of food, fuel, and provisions. New York market, prices of staple items. And then down here we have the Massachusetts Bureau of Statistics and Labor. So I looked at all these places. And what I found is that... Um, here is the comparative price of wages. This one's from Massachusetts. And here you see in 1855 that low quality bread was five cents each. So a four cent loaf of bread is really low quality bread, you would think. I would assume that that's what this is telling me. So what this means is that they're buying the cheapest flour, maybe mixing it with other kinds of flour, which I find very interesting. Here we have the New York market and wheat flour ranges from 520 to 831 a barrel. I also found this website here, choosingvoluntarysimplicity.com, and the, the person who runs this site has diaries from the 19th century discussing daily food stuffs. Um, and she says that a barrel of wheat is $7.14, 
And then this catalog of goods from the National Park Service at, you know, the U.S. National Park Service that tells us that flour in 1870 is $3 per barrel. So what we're seeing is a wide range of prices for flour per barrel. What this is giving me is like the connection between wheat and prices, but not the connection between wheat and bread and like how large bread should be. So I went back to my Google and I put in four cent bakers loaf bread 1850 and this is on this you know the first page didn't have anything that was useful or anything I hadn't seen before. The second page however had this uh, history of Detroit and Michigan and it talks about bread. So I decided to check that out and this was a really interesting book. And it talks about the regulations of bread. This gives a little history of bread, but it says right here that in Detroit, Michigan, the second ordinance passed by the trustees under the incorporation of 1802 prescribed the weight and cost of a loaf as three pounds English weight for six pence New York currency. And this is a two pound loaf of bread for four cents. That's what this means. Now it was repealed in 1802, and then there are other kind of gauges of weight uh, for bread and eventually all these are repealed but some things that I found really interesting is they calculated that a barrel of flour was estimated to produce 3920 ounces of bread and the baker was allowed to take money for this right for baking it as for labor if you take all of the prices for for a barrel of flour and you divide that into 3,920 ounces of bread per barrel, for four cents you get between one pound and 1.75 pounds of bread. And that last one is pretty close to two pounds of bread. But if we take away labor, if we change the labor cost, we get anywhere from one to three pounds of bread. So this is where I got my corroboration that a loaf of bread was about two pounds. And when I did the recipe, it worked. And so I'm not gonna like keep questioning where I got this amount from. I'm pretty sure that by the time I figured this out, I was just really tired of looking. And I saw this three pounds English weight for six pence New York currency, um, even though it was 1802 and even though it was in Detroit, corroborated this other thing that I had seen. So by looking at all these different websites and older texts, I basically came to the conclusion that a four cent baker's loaf was roughly two pounds of bread. This is asking for a half of a four cent baker's loaf, which is one pound, and I'm doing a half batch. So this is a half a pound of bread. All that being said, hours and hours it took me. It probably took me three hours to figure out how this worked. So I took the bread, I took a half a pound of bread, and I took off the crust because the crust is kind of like junky and I knew it had to soak in milk. So I did that and I ended up with a half a pound of just the crumb of the inside. And then it says, um, boil the milk, slice the bread, and pour the boiling milk over it. I tore the bread into chunks and I'll put a picture of that right here. And then I boiled the milk um, until it was frothy. I didn't want it to boil, boil, um, just until it was frothy. And I poured that over and I'll put a picture of that, what that looks like here. So, um, and I, it says a one quart of milk, so I used two cups of milk. And as you can see in this picture, it actually seems to be the perfect amount. So I feel pretty good about that. Then you stand it away to cool. So basically you you want the milk to soak into the bread for as long as it takes to cool. And I left this a little bit longer because I had other things I had to do today, um, but it probably has been sitting here for about four hours, right? Um, just soaking in the milk. But you could do this the night before and leave it in the fridge and let it soak and that would work too. Then beat the eggs and it's three eggs. So that's about 150 grams of eggs that we discovered from, you know, couple jumbles ago. Um, so I have I have one very large egg. I have about 70 grams of one egg right here because I'm doing a half. One gill of dried currants. So I have, uh, you know, I'm doing a half a cup of dried berries. Um, and then add, so beat the eggs and add them and the sugar when the milk is cool. 
wash, pick, and flour the currants and stir them into the mixture. Put it in a pudding dish and bake it a half hour in a moderate oven. Serve it with or without sweet sauce. And we'll talk more about the sweet sauce in a second. But my oven is set to 350. Um, and I saw on a different website that I was looking at that you want to press the bread into the milk and make sure that it's all kind of together. So what I have here is the bread that had been pressed. I have a little lid and then I have um, my ginger extract that I just am making at the moment. Um, I took a picture of this, so I'll insert that here as well. Let's take this off. And as you can see, it's really well kind of mushed with the, with the stuff. So what I'm going to do is get a spoon, pour in the milk and the sugar. I'm probably not gonna flour the currants because I don't have the energy to do that. Um, and then I'm gonna put it in this baking dish here and we'll bake it for half hour and see how it goes. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the sweet sauce because I did some research on the sweet sauce as well and we'll see what we come up with. So the egg is all mixed in and this is just kind of a really basic recipe which means that you can put whatever you want in at this point. You could put some vanilla extract in which I might do. You can put in chocolate chips or raisins or I don't know what else you put in bread pudding. You put apples right? You could put kind of anything you want in this bread pudding and it should work. Cinnamon, nutmeg. Um, yeah, but we're going to put in some dried sweetened cranberries because that's what I have. And some dried cherries because So that is my bread pudding. I'm going to put it in this container. It does not say does not say to grease the container, to grease the dish. I don't think I'm going to. We'll see what happens. So we'll put that in. I want to put this in the oven. 50 for 30 minutes. So that's in the oven and I want to talk about what she calls a sweet sauce and I looked through this recipe book. I looked through her young wife's cookbook and I did not see any recipe for something called a sweet sauce. So again I started doing some digging and I'm sure that someone has done all this work for me and I just don't know who they are which is a shame. Oh well, what are you gonna do? I did some searching and what I discovered is that a sweet sauce is also called a pudding sauce. And basically a pudding sauce is alcohol and butter and sugar is essentially what it is. So I found a website, a blog called um, The Cookbook of Unknown Ladies, which is apparently a nonprofit group that looks at this particular cookbook called The Cookbook of Unknown Ladies, um, and I'll put the link below. And they have Pudding Sauce 19th Century, and this sounds promising. This is a glass of sherry, half a glass of brandy, two teaspoonfuls of pounded lump sugar, a little grated lemon peel, and a quarter pint of thick melted butter, and then you grate nutmeg over the top. Um, I don't have sherry, I do have brandy. I have sugar, lemon, and butter. I did some searching and apparently you can replace sherry with vanilla extract and water to add more liquid. I'm going to do that because I have tons of vanilla extract. So I'm going to get all that organized and see what we come up with. Yeah, so I'm basically going to try and make this sauce and I'm not going to do it on camera because I want to do it on a stove so I can cook off some of the alcohol. So I can cook off all the alcohol actually. But I'm hopeful that it will turn into something good and I'll show you at the end. So this is what it looks like after 
a half hour and I think it needs more time. So I'm gonna put it in for another 10 minutes so it browns a little bit more. It's cooled down a bit, but still a little bit warm. I feel like you want bread pudding to be warm. Um, and I have poured a little bit of this sweet sauce over it, which I have to be honest, a little bit bland. Sweet sauce is a little bit bland, um, but it looks like bread pudding. So let's, let's try it. I only got a little bit because I'm about to have dinner and I don't want to ruin my dinner. The bread pudding itself is really quite good, actually. I'm surprised. I was expecting it to not be that great. And the nice thing about this recipe is that it's really basic. And so you can replace the, well, I replaced the currants, obviously, but you could put chocolate chips in it or raisins in it. And I mentioned this, or nuts in it. It would taste really good with nuts. The, the sauce, I'm not feeling. Um, you know, I live in the southern U.S. And the place where we're getting dinner actually makes really good bread pudding and their sauce has bourbon in it and bourbon would have been really nice in this instead of brandy but I think overall this was a success so I'm gonna finish this up off camera so you don't have to watch me eat but I hope that you enjoyed exploring again the national cookbook and learning more about the history of bread I am not baking this coming weekend and instead next Tuesday I'm going to post a how I hoop my my embroidery piece videos, how I finish my hoops. So, um, but maybe I'll come back in a couple weeks. There is a pumpkin that recipe I want to try. I have a pumpkin randomly that I want to make into something. So there's like a pumpkin pudding or something. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what I do in a couple weeks. But with all that being said, I'm going to call this a success. And thank you all so much for joining me. Um, I will put the links to all of the information in the description below, along with the original recipe and my converted recipe. I'm not going to include this sauce. The sauce isn't that great. It doesn't actually add anything to it. Um, but this with some ice cream, oh boy, that's going to be great. Anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Um, please take care of yourselves, and I hope you all have a good one.